Um, yeah, I think for, for many contemporary artists today, uh, the legacy of John Ruskin is not merely one of aesthetics and of, of uh, particular ways of uh, um, uh, drawing or um, uh, making in a, in a practical sense, but also in a way of, of looking at the world and particularly at uh, shifting social, environmental and economic functions of contemporary art. Uh, Ruskin's thinking in that way um, and his influence in that way has a particular meaning, has a particular resonance and a particular urgency. And that is something that uh, we would like to explore today with uh, Jorge, who actually in 2016 um, had an art installation uh, of his work at uh, Westminster Hall that some of you might have uh, might have seen. Jorge is not only a New York-based artist and architect, he's also a preservationist. Um, he uh, is uh, extraordinarily important at the um, Columbia School of Architecture. Um, and uh, maybe we just start in medias res and uh, we will just start describing your project and asking questions about that. Does that sound good? Yeah, I mean, just to say that, yeah, we're, we're going to start um, talking about the ethics of dust, which I think is a, um, began in 2006, was it? And is an ongoing project. Um, and of course, many of you recognize that title, obviously, is um, being taken from John Ruskin. Um, so we thought, yeah, this would be a nice opportunity to talk, walk you through that project. Um, a section of which was exhibited at the Whitworth in, a, in our exhibition earlier this year, which I'll mention a little bit about later on. Um, so yeah, let's 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 start. Yeah, what, 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 what are we? What do we see here, uh, Jorge? A painting in the National Gallery. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, this is a painting by Seurat, which um, I was uh, drawn to as part of this series. Uh, which the series is essentially about cleaning buildings, and I was I was really uh, drawn to Ruskin's call n not to touch buildings. And I asked myself, you know, why do we, as preservationists, constantly clean buildings and make them look anew? And so it's a dialogue with that. And I was drawn to this picture because I was uh, asked by Louis Vuitton to do a work for their private museum, which is in, at Louis Vuitton's original factory. And it turns out that he, his factory was one of those chimneys up there um, in Anier. And this was just, for me, a really interesting painting because on the one hand you have, you know, workers here taking a break from work, but somebody's got them working on a Sunday, you know, because one of the chimneys is, is, is going. Um, so if we could have the next slide. Um, this is Mr. Louis Vuitton's house on the left, and to the right is his workshop where that chimney would have been. And so this was going to be an exhibit inside the right building of all of the major trunks and designs that um, Louis Vuitton designed. And so my contribution was this um, sheet on the right, which you can see is a cast of the pollution that the factory itself dropped on Mr. Louis Vuitton's house, because he lived right there uh, in the factory. Um, and so part of what this allows you to do is to really look closely at dust to look closely at the dust that settles upon buildings and to begin to reflect on where this dust comes from. And it comes from the sky. It come, it, you know, most of it is environmental pollution. And I think this is what really drew me to Ruskin because he was really at this moment in which he has this famous passage in the storm cloud of the 19th century where he says the last, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but the last clean, unpolluted sky I saw was in March 1871 over London. You know, so just this, moment in which dust really is no longer just stones becoming a kind of, you know, back to dust and cycle, but there's a man-made element here to the, to dust and to what we can see. So if we see the next one, you know, this was um, a work that I did at the um, Victoria and Albert Museum in which I was very interested in this cast. It's their largest object. Um, it's the Trajan's Column. And it's set on a chimney that was built by the same people who were building the chimneys in, the, you know, in Sheffield and, and, and so on. And for me, that chimney should be an object in the collection of the Victor and Albert Museum, but it's actually not. It's their largest object, but it's not in the collection. So I wanted to, in a way, call attention to it. Uh, we'll have the next. And so what I did was to clean the chimney inside. The, the, the chimney has never really been opened up. I think they open it now as a result of this project. And so you can see 
in the next image the process a little bit. So what I do is I, I apply latex to the buildings. And uh, so it's a very manual process. It's a very kind of labor intensive process. It's also a great moment because you get to be right up there in the building and you, you get to see the building in a completely different way. Uh, and then I cover the, the building in, in latex. And, uh, and so you can see here the process. Now the latex, when you first apply it, is white, and then it dries. And just to be very, very explicit about this, Jorge, uh, this is a very um, established uh, preservation technique now, isn't it? Well, it, it is in a way now, but it, didn't, it wasn't when I started. I mean, yeah. um, this is now probably, a, you know, it, the, the project's been going on for about a decade now for me, and uh, when I first started, this was being used in small, you know, latex applications were for small sculptures. And so this idea of a very large surface being done was, uh, was relatively new. Um, uh, but it is used now, but what happens is people apply the latex, they clean the building, and then they throw the latex out with all the pollution. And so my whole point was that, you know, we're losing a big part of the history of, you know, we, we can't see clearly if we, uh, if we throw this out. And we, we, we need to be able to see this dust and the, if we're going to understand environmental pollution. Because if we are in cities and all we see are clean buildings and we have no sense that of what, you know, when we talk about pollution, it's a kind of abstraction. But it's very real. You know, it's stuck on every surface. So um, if you go to the next one, then this is, this is what the latex, once, once we removed it as, uh, from inside the chimney and placed it right next to the chimney. So what you're seeing is the, the, the plaster cast on the outside of the chimney in the cast courts of the V&A. And then, in a way, taken from the inside of that cylinder, the latex cast placed right next to it. And that's why it looks a little bit different because it's, it's brick, you know, it's brick all around. It's, you know, it's the inside of that. But you see the dust. For me, it was very important to put the dust in there. You know, we talked about collections uh, in the conference because this is the greatest hits of European culture, you know, the cast courts. And for me, it was important to put pollution in there to say, you know, that we can't, we, we can't have all this culture that we had unless we also made all this pollution. Uh, and so to put it in the museum and to consider this material pollution as, a, uh, as worthy of, an, of, of scrutiny, you know, of, of, of artistic scrutiny, not just, you know, a kind of abstraction uh, in scientific journals. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, the counterpoint. I mean, this is how I, I, I kind of started was because of Ruskin's obsession with this building. And so when I got to this building, looking, of course, as many of us uh, do, looking for Ruskin's traces, the building was completely clean. And it's been cleaned and over-cleaned and re-cleaned uh, every 30 years. And so for the Art Biennial, uh, I found one wall left in this building that had not been cleaned. And that's just behind the loggia, where the, you know, the tourists can't see that part. Um, as you probably know, a lot of the capitals of this building, because of the overcleaning, have been removed. And they're actually now inside the building in the museum to the building. So down at the bottom of the loggia here, those windows, all of the original pieces of the building are there. And what you're looking at is actually replicas of the building in the facade itself. So I went ahead and, and removed the dust from, the, um, from that wall to show it, and there, you know, the next one is how it was exhibited at the Venice Biennale. And this is after the cleaning. So you can see the arch on the left is very white. The Pietra d'Istria is still very, very white because that's been power washed. But with uh, our cleaning, the, the stone is still gray. I mean, it still has the patina, you know, the, 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 the way the color of the stone changes with, with uh, contact with air, but it, the dust is off. And you don't add any anything to the latex. What do you? No, it's pure latex. It's just a mechanical action. So what happens is when the latex dries, mm -hmm. because it's it's basically water, as the water evaporates, it only has one way to go, which mm -hmm. is out, and it basically suctions out the dust, and the dust just gets embedded in the okay, in the yeah. in the latex. So you, it looks kind of like a photograph, mm. you know. And so I'm, I was very drawn to the daguerreotypes. 
I love looking at daguerreotypes because you feel like you're actually looking at the same rays of light somehow. You know, it just has an immediacy that a, mm -hmm. a digital photograph doesn't have. And this, many people thought, was a large photograph, but mm -hmm. but the pixels are actually, you know, dust. Yes. Phys yeah. physical remnants yeah. and, and accumulations and sedimentations of, of dust, but also of history in a certain way. Okay. Yeah. Which you, which, which you hear explicitly then um, bring to the fore of the visitor and to the, to the attention of the visitor. And of course it's, you know, it's the Doge's palace, it's the, it's the side of the you know, ruler of the Venetian Empire, the naval empire, and, and of course you know, Ruskin was there as part of another naval empire that was building up in the 19th century, which was uh, the British Empire, and so the, the correlative to the, the two works, you know, uh, that have to do with it, you know, the Gothic, naval empire, the houses of government, you know, the politics of it, um, and our, uh, is, is of course Westminster Hall, which, mm -hmm. which was rebuilt during his lifetime. And, and this was a project that you became involved in, at which point, how, does it, how did it start? How were you approached um, to do the Westminster Project? So this was a project commissioned by Art Angel here, uh, which you probably know, uh, uh, um, uh, art found fund here in, uh, in London that does public art. And we started talking about a project to do here in London. And I was very keen to, to clean Westminster Hall. They were already cleaning it, and they were deciding on which method. They finally did settle on latex. Uh, very complex, um, you know, collaboration with parliamentary estates, um, and so we spent six years through that process of collecting all of the latex that was coming off the wall, storing it in a, you know, mine in Wiltshire, and um, and then, you know, putting it putting it back together. But of course, this this is the original Gothic building that led to the Neo Gothic <laughs> building. But it's a really important piece of history. So if you go to the next slide, of course, where uh, Charles I heard his death sentence after he tried to suspend Parliament, you know. <laughs> uh, so just thought we'd throw that in there. Um, uh, and then, of course, when it burnt, um, Everybody tried to save this this building. It was, and had, had there been ever uh, any, what, what kind of cleaning had the, um, had been done in Westminster Hall uh, since the, the fire? There's no evidence of it, it, it having been cleaned. Really? So, so your intervention, your your cleaning, your um, uh, moment of, of of working there really removed all those layers of history and then exposed them back to the, uh, to the public eye. Yeah, I mean, nobody really knows. I, I would imagine that they probably cleaned it after the fire, but we don't know. There's there no, no evidence, there's no record. Yeah. Okay. So it could be, I mean, um, but my, I suspect they, they did clean it mm -hmm. right after. So I, I would imagine that this is dust really from, you know, the 1840s, 50s up until the, you know, the present. Um, so that's just part of the scaffolding and the works. The next slide is really interesting because you can see part of the walls clean, part of the walls dirty. So you can see the degree of dust that came off the wall, you know, just how clean uh, it became. And then the next one is the installation shot of it inside um, Westminster Hall. So we, we decided to do just one wall. Um, and as, as fate would have it, the, the show opened the week of the Brexit vote. So it was unplanned. We had no idea. It was supposed to be a quiet summer, and that's why they approved you know, the, the, the show. It's the first time there's a contemporary artwork inside of Westminster Hall. And it was um, really something to be in that space when that vote came in, and um, you know, the politicians were coming in and out, and, you can see how the work is set off of the wall by four meters. So, you know, I, I remember Boris Johnson coming through here and taking calls behind the ethics of dust, um, sort of trying to hide from the, you know, the rest of the journalists and so on. It was, this, it, this was the day of the result. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's it was very um, unsettling, you know. Mm. But, but then I think the... Um, 
the work then had an afterlife. Mm, absolutely. And, and that's where I think you yeah. became part of the story. Yeah, so this, so this, as you see this work now, um, how, I don't know how many metres it was. 50. 50 yeah. metres long. Yeah. Um, Five zero. Yes, and it's suspended from the top and as you can see backlit so you get the full effect of the, of the dust. And if you go to the next slide, at the end of the installation, um, it was, I guess, split up, yep. um, taken down into sections, and those six sections were then, or six of those sections were then um, distributed to uh, public collections, um, of which the Whitworth was, was one of them, which we were um, thrilled to welcome that into our collection. And that was maybe a couple of years ago, and we've been thinking about um, a way of presenting this work, and of course this year offered um, a really perfect opportunity. Um, so what you see is on the right hand side here is the ethics of dust, one panel um, in our galleries. Um, you can't get a good sense of our gallery in that, that sense, but this is in, in um, an exhibition that we presented earlier this year um, that marked the anniversary, Ruskin's anniversary year. Um, so, and um, that exhibition was framed very much by a lecture that uh, John Ruskin gave in Manchester in 1857, um, The Political Economy of Art, um, also known as A Joy Forever and its price in the market. And, um, and this was given, this lecture was given on the occasion of the Great Art Treasures of Great Britain, um, one of the largest art exhibitions ever to take place in Manchester. Um, and it had over 16,000 works of art, it had the patronage of Queen Victoria, it had its own iron and glass pavilion and railway station, it was a big, big um, event. And as the leading art critic of the day, of course, John Ruskin was invited to speak. Um, but he chose not to speak about art directly, but to speak about the social and economic conditions that shaped um, the way art is valued, the way it's received, and the way it circulates. Um, and so we took this as a kind of, uh, as a provocation and the exhibition was very much a, a kind of test site to think about the way in which these ideas, um, how we take them up today, how people have responded, um, how these ideas have been put into action. Um, so this particular, this it was three rooms, and um, it looked very broadly. In fact, Robert's um, lecture last night was nice. I mentioned the um, the eback. One of the rooms was dedicated to a campaign against the eback. We worked with some school children to use our collection to kind of create a protest about the devaluate, uh, devalue, devaluing of art in, in the education system. Um, that's just one of the other of the projects. But this in this particular room, um, we looked at the architecture of politics, and what we did is we um, sorry if you just go back to that slide um, there. <coughs> we had um, the ethics of dust op um, in dialogue with a number of works um, by John Ruskin, um, drawings by John Ruskin of um, the facade of the Doge's Palace, this being one of them. This is from Manchester Art Gallery's brilliant collection. Um, and this is um, a later one from about 1870, showing the corner, the vine angle, with uh, two of Noah's sons on the side there. Um, so we had this sort of dialogue between that kind of Gothic um, architecture of Venice, and of course this is all coming from um, Ruskin's notion of, and the idea of that the, um, the values and ethics of a society is reflected in, in its architecture. So this is obviously one of the questions we're talking about here with this, um, when, we talk, when we look at this um, at pollution or we think about environmental change. Um, so we had Venice on one side, we've got Westminster on the other, and then if you flip to the next slide, Daniel, sorry, if you <laughs> um, we had, this is a, the other end of the gallery, and what you can see on the left, uh, along the wall, are, are architectural drawings by Albert Waterhouse, who designed the neo-Gothic um, Manchester Town Hall. So in the 18, this is, his drawings are from, if you can go to the next one, 1860, by 1868, he was designing this, and it was built in, in a few years later. Um, and of course, um, this is part of taking up uh, this, you know, neo-Gothic revival. Um, and the facade of the this is just one detail of one um, one side of the building. But this idea that um, the facade was about, you know, reflecting that um, that value of craftsmanship and. And then the sort of communal values that are in um, that you know they held in in uh, Gothic architecture. However, um, being Manchester, uh, what happened was that um, Albert Waterhouse's um, design was slightly watered down. So on the on the facade of the building, the decoration was kind of pared back. It was a very pragmatic decision. Um, 
uh, simply because it, it seemed silly to spend money on such uh, lavish decoration when it would be covered so quickly in smog. Um, and so we come back to this question of dust and we come back to this question of pollution and we come back to this idea of um, what constitutes, uh, you know, governing a healthy society. Um, so <laughs> one of my questions would be, would be um, thinking about this in an activist way and do you see your practice as, as having an activist quality in terms of... Um, well, in terms of highlighting pollution and what that means. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it didn't start off that way. Right. I mean, I didn't really start off that way, but it certainly has become that. Um, and, and on a personal level, you know, because I've, I've just looking at the stuff, you just realize how much there, there was and how very little there is left. You know, Paris was completely cleaned under Malraux. Um, New York has been washed, uh, London, there's very little pollution left on the buildings. Um, and so you wonder just what that means in terms of um, our ability to, to gauge our impact. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's become, but it, but it also has acquired a little bit, you know, at first I thought I was mm, cleaning buildings. And now I realize I'm kind of collecting pieces of the atmosphere, you know. Mm -hmm. for, for, you know, yeah, and so it yeah. just kind of has shifted over, over the decade. And tell, talk, tell me a little bit about, um, tell us all, all a little bit about Ruskin's influence on on your thinking about preservation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the, it's interesting for me. Um, Ruskin was a polymath, mm. so I just I am very keen to maintain that aspect of him and not to look at only little pieces of him, you know, only his writing, only his sketches. Or, because when, I think once you begin to isolate, you know, the, the, the parts, the facets of, of Ruskin, then you, then you lose the, what, you know, the, what's really interesting about him. Because, of course, there were many people that wrote better than him, many people that, you know, drew better than mm -hmm. him. Many people that you know lectured better than him, but mm -hmm. but few people that could do all of that together and kind of put it in a way. And as I look more and more about that, you know, materials really are so important for him, like physical things in his thinking. And so we talked about the mineral collections and so on. But the dust, mm -hmm. like you know, when you see dust appearing in this text and that text and that other text, and it's a kind of um, it's a thread. Uh, it appears in the watercolors, you know, it's, it's, you know, he's really drawing as much the building as the stains on the building. Mm -hmm. Very few people really paid so much attention to how the building is stained. Mm -hmm. He talks about the staining. Uh, then he translates that to the dust in the sky. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the clouds and the storm clouds having a kind of dust in them that comes from the south that mm -hmm. doesn't, is it, so the earth becoming sky, you know, and so in his writings and in his, engagement with materiality, dust has um, a, kind of, um, a kind of role of transitioning between kinds of uh, expressions, between, between kinds of, um, you know, media even. And so that's, I, I became very interested in that. And so now as I, you know, these works, for example, the more I think about them, the more I think about the atmosphere. And, um, and the more I'm now thinking about, you know, just, um, you know, airborne dust. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm, the, Ruskin for me cued me into the importance of, of dust. As a, as a kind of thing, you know, uh, that is... That, that is um, That's overlooked yeah. and um, largely... I it's, mean. it's overlooked also as a kind of cycle, you know, it's, it's mm. fetishized in itself as mm. a kind of um, uh, image of, you know, dirtiness or, or, or whatever. But he saw it as a cycle. Like he saw it becoming stone and then becoming dust and then, on, you know, crystallizing and, and different kinds of dust. You know, obviously in the ethics of, of the dust, he talks about how dust crystallizes into different minerals. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and he draws analogies for society from that. You know, he, he's very, 
he's sort of, a, he, he's a little too quick, right? And he's like, oh, well, this is a pure crystal, this is an impure crystal, there are pure kinds of souls in the world, impure kind of souls in the world. Um, I, was, I was going to ask, to, to what degree are these, th those moralistic interpretations of Ruskin, by Ruskin, um, of, uh, of dust and so on, in, in what, to what degree are they relevant to, to you as an artist now and to other artists today? Yeah. Is that something that's just as important as, as his uh, I think other thinking? I, I'm more drawn to the ethics and the morals, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I, you know, I see morals as, you know, this is what you should and shouldn't do, and ethics is more like, let's talk about it, you know. Which, <laughs> uh, nice. yeah. uh, so I, I think that uh, it's important, the ethical component is important, because he, I think for me, what he draws is a kind of urgency to the need to talk about it and to come and, de and to debate about it. Mm. But in that debate, there is a sense that there's something worth debating and that there is some sort of reasonable way of debating. And unfortunately, I mean, I think less so in Europe, but certainly, you know, in the US, um, uh, the, the debate about climate is, um, is, is really, uh, it's really moralistic. It's not mm -hmm. an ethical debate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is uh, even, even theological. Uh, and that, I think, is very problematic. So we, we have to sort of mm -hmm. have the debate. But, uh, and, and the urgency of Ruskin, I think, is very important. Because, you know, ultimately, um, you know, if we are, if we are killing life, yeah. What's the point of? I think I think one important yeah I think one important thing that this uh, brings up is this idea of the also the corruption of nature, which could be a whole other um, discussion on what constitutes nature today. Yeah. Um, one of the th uh, the displays we had in the show was um, a number of you know minerals, but alongside crystalline forms that have been developed. Um, from nuclear waste um, from the Dalton Cumbrian Institute that's in Cum you know on the Cumbrian coastline. So this idea of that shifting um, state of, 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 um, of nature and what Ruskin would think of that. Um, but this and I think that's for us that's what this kind of um, your work so brilliantly kind of um, brings out. The, the moral dilemmas of both Ruskin's time and still that we're still grappling with today. Mm which Ruskin now allows us to think about in different ways. Yeah. For me, for me, it was very important to put it in the halls of government, you know? Mm. That, that was really important that, like, parliamentarians would see this, and they saw it, you know, for a few months. I think they probably were busy with, you know... Sure, they were quite busy. ...with <laughs> something else, but still, hopefully, some, something yeah. stayed. Okay, well, I think that will probably lead quite nicely into um, Alistair's... Uh, paper about yeah the um, the relevance of Ruskin's um, social and political ideas today. Should we? Right. Jorge, thank you very much, Poppy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.